We are living in the age of mass production. Everywhere I look, products are standardized, ready to ship, off the shelf. It's convenient, but all kinds of boring. My name is Gib, a Japanese YouTuber living in Singapore. Oh, I like your hairstyle. <laughs> I've created over 200 videos of my life in the Lion City. But one thing I haven't done is to make videos about truly made in Singapore products. Back in Japan, I grew up around handmade traditional craft. I want to find the same spirit and dedication here in modern high-tech Singapore. You can see through yeah, your hands. Wow. Oh my gosh, that's that beautiful. And meet the people handmaking beautiful things. Bring over sometimes okay. impossible. All right, here you go. In this right, episode, ready. I'll see if I can cut it. Where should I hold so I, I, uh, so I don't so, cut my fingers? As an apprentice to a local furniture artisan. To be a good woodworker, it would take about six months. For Gib to actually say he wants to do it in one week. Young and naive. Three months ago, I finally got the keys to my new HDB apartment. I think I can be considered almost Singaporean now. Welcome to my brand new flat, which as you can see, is missing some furniture. So for the next week, I'm on a mission to make a piece of furniture with my own hand, a coffee table. When it comes to wooden furniture, we all know the big names. But in the last decade or so, Singapore has seen a boom in small, bespoke carpentry. In fact, according to the Ministry of Manpower, there are currently 1,500 indie furniture makers. What's interesting, they are all below 30. Well, I'm 31, so I wonder, What's the appeal of furniture making for young Singaporeans? To find out, I'm going to apprentice myself with a woodworker who has made a name for himself, all before turning 33. Hi, Gib. Hey, Ahmad. Hey, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah. This is so beautiful. Ahmad is the founder of a six-year-old workshop, Urban Salvation. As you can see, the wood can be bent, right? Yes. This woodworking wizard's specialty is using salvaged and recycled materials to create one-of-a-kind pieces. As you can see here, I have one that is going to be uh, off to a young client. They actually salvaged from their grandma's uh, sewing machine legs. Oh, this is a sewing machine. One, a lot of younger generations in my era are more interested to have a heritage piece in their homes. Bespoke furniture is something tailor-made for you. It's supposed to showcase you as a person. For example, like if you're a big executive boss, a CEO, the desk represents you. And when it's done, they have one-off pieces that no one else has. So this is the plywood used in mass-produced furniture. And this one, the wood uh, Ahmad uses. The thickness is very different. You can smell the glue, right? It smells not natural. Yes. Kind of. I hate the smell. That's why I only work with solid wood. Why do you specialize in wood? One thing about wood is that it's very unique. It can be bent, can be steamed. You can mix it with marble, you can mix it with metal. So the freedom of design is there for wood and it's really fun to work with wood. Ahmad was really passionate about his work. Um, he, he would spend so much time, effort, uh, perfecting his furniture, and that really motivated me to uh, make my own coffee table. Oh, sure, but go. first, we need to go wood hunting. I was expecting to head to a lumber yard, but instead, Ahmad brings me here. 
factory that makes wooden pallets. What I will soon realize is that these pallets are made out of recycled wood. This place is extraordinary. It's, it's a warehouse of wood. Yes, these are the things that people don't get to see. It's heaven for me because I can use a lot of this wood. This is where Ahmad sometimes comes to get his raw materials. Why do you use these reclaimed woods in the first place? Um, one of the big factors is that uh, it helps uh, to leave lesser carbon footprint. We don't dump it at the, uh, at the landfill. Yes. And you're also cutting less trees. Yes. yes. In 2019, wood accounted for 438,000 tons of solid waste generated in Singapore. These are enough wood to make me 31 million coffee tables. I mean, being sustainable is great, but looking at all these scrap woods, I, I don't see the wild factor yet. You can actually cut this portion that is damaged, and then you can still use this. Right. From there, I can make feature walls. Uh, I can make mosaic uh, kind of uh, designs. I can make chevron designs, table, coffee tables, and all this. That's amazing. Yeah. Looks the same to me. <laughs> With all this wood to choose from, I decided to go with pine. It's a soft wood, and Amma told me it's easier for beginners like me to handle. So I think I found the perfect wood that speaks to me. Yep, we can work with this for your project. All right. Yep. I'm lucky enough to have Ahmad help me with my table at no charge. Usually, his pieces run from $200 to more than $8,000. Reclaimed wood, most people would say it's supposed to be cheap, but I beg to differ. It's really super hard to achieve from scrap reclaimed wood to a fresh lumber. You yeah. inspect for the nails or anything else. Once right. you have all this removed, you actually cut to size. You have to remove the nails, you have to mill it, you have to plane it, and then you have to straighten it. And then from there, you can start working on it. All right, go. All right, okay, I'm ready. Okay. Push down. Yep. Ooh. Okay. Okay. So once you uh, push it in, all right. Good job. Thank well done. You. Wow. Time. So as you can see, you I have two do? pieces of plank now. Yep, good job. Good job. Right, once you see that it's straight, right, it has no much burr, right. that means your machine is good, your work pace is good, and you can work with it. Right. A bit scared, but <laughs> I've never used such a machine. Ah. <laughs> to make a bespoke furniture, it really takes some time. It takes about four to 12 weeks, depending on this, whether it's small or big item. To be a good woodworker, it will take about six months. For Gabe to actually say he wants to do it in one week, uh, I can only smile, uh, like how my mentor treat me, young and naive. Where should I hold so, like, I, uh, so I don't so cut my fingers? Whenever you are pushing, okay. your hands is just fitting until here. I was terrified when I saw the saw like, slowly coming out from the table. They were so sharp, so big. Um, I almost regretted taking part in this show, but I did it, yeah. I had to do it. <laughs> This is your first cut from through the table saw. Wow. Oh, it's so smooth. Yep. Wow. This was the most intimidating process today. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. Because right. the, the, the saw is just like a horror film. Horror film. I am building a coffee table with the help of Ahmad Al Habshi, the founder of six year old furniture company Urban Salvation. You know, Ahmad, without your help, this thing will be sawdust by now. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you get into woodworking? About seven years back, I was working at the uh, entertainment industry and uh, I told myself I want to try something new, a uh, career change, and I got into a furniture company and they had a lot of scrap wood at the back. From scrap wood, I made a shelf. 
some scrap wood, I made a coffee table and got sold for $850. And I was like, this is it. This is going to be my, my, my full time and my career. Before I started the company, I went to look for some teachers to actually teach me. So I had to go to Google, like Sungai Kadot, I had to go to Yunos. When I approached local craftsmen, they didn't want to teach me. I had to stay there for seven days and beg him to teach me. During the seventh day, I wanted to give up. He saw me standing up and he asked me, Ahmad, can you take some piece of wood and pass it to me? And that was the first time. That step. was the moment. When I heard how Ahmad got started, I definitely uh, felt his passion and dedication because I, I can't imagine myself pleading to be taught for seven days. He had to beg seven days to be taught. And that was just so mind-blowing. In Singapore, there was not much uh, master craftsmen. And I had to learn abroad. For example, Indonesia. And it was fun. It was really an adventure. I, I get to sleep beside a uh, sheep, a uh, goat, uh, chicken, whatever it took to become a woodworker. I think I did it. Armed with skills he picked up from Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, Ama started Urban Salvation in 2015. When I first started making for a client, she gave me a check while the agreement was uh, cash on delivery. And after paying all the drivers for transport, I only left uh, $2 in my pocket. Two dollars. I had to wait three days after that to get some money. I learned the hard way and uh, I go through it and I got stronger. I have done uh, amazing things and I have done crazy things for my clients and it has been so fun. To date, Ahmad has sold over 875 pieces of furniture and his customers come from all walks of life. He took me to where it began. Coming ahead is uh, the way I started all my woodworking adventures. Here? Yep. Uh, welcome to my house. So basically, I have a small workstation here. Wow. And I built all small, small stuff here. I can't imagine your neighbors were happy, were they? Most of the homeowners here are actually pioneer generations. And they are living in a kampong style. Kampong and they don't style, mind. I yeah. like that. Yep. Ahmad's parents you still live here. Oh, they didn't hi. want to appear on camera, hi. but I did meet Ahmad's brother, Mustafa. Thank you. Yes, thank you, sir. So let me guess. Which furniture is made by you? Yep, some um, of it, yeah. Let's take a guess. Okay. I'm guessing it's a TV console. Yep, exactly. Okay. Wow, you're good at it now. My recent work is actually behind the door. Yep, we can pull it out. Yep. This oh, is a shoe cabinet. Yep. And uh, this is uh, actually using reclaimed tick. My mom just needs some shoe rack uh, to hide all the shoes. Ahmad's mom did not always love his work. She did not approve when Ahmad quit his corporate job as a supervisor to start woodworking seven years ago. When I was sec one, I stayed back. And then sec three, I stayed back and I quit school. I didn't tell any much about what I do outside with my parents. When I got my full-time job, they saw that I was doing very well. And then suddenly, after a few years, I wanted to become a woodworker. Say I want to work for a furniture company, take a pay cut. It horrified them. So they were really reluctant to actually support me in what I do. They think I'm still playful. They expect him to get a good job, you know, job. and then grow from there. And then I quit to pursue furniture making. I took a big pay cut, right? <laughs> yeah. Was, wasn't that tough, like continuing like that, like without having any support or...? Mm, I had a few uh, part-time jobs. Uh, I did uh, grab. Most of my money goes to investment of my uh, tools. Everything is bought one by one, yes. and it was really tough. It was grueling times, but I managed to pull it through. How did your family react? After five years, they were shocked when I was on the, on the newspaper, newspaper, two page. And it was like, how much do you pay for it? <laughs> they I thought like, you pay. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I said, no, I didn't pay anything. Mm. And I was like, oh, really? Oh, wow. Has your mom accepted what you are doing right now? Yeah, it, it took a, bit, a few years. I would say around three, four years to convince her. One thing is his dedication and determination to succeed. That is what we siblings praise him for. 
when I heard Ahmad's story about his parents not approving about him, I can totally relate to it because the same thing will happen in Japan. Uh, if you quit your company and you do something for yourself, your family is going to be happy. They'll be worried. So I'm really happy that he has a good, um, he's in a good situation right now. In the early days of Urban Salvation, it was really tough. As a person who doesn't have experience in business, when you took the project, there was no way to say, uh, no, I cannot complete it. So I have to do this. Even if I have to take one meal a day, I would do it. If I have to go through again, I would go through again. Meanwhile, I'm trying to complete my own coffee table, provided I don't burn it down first. So now I'm working on my tabletop. Uh, I'm actually burning the outer side to give it a better look. Yep, you are making the aesthetic look good. Yes. Uh, it's fun, it's fun. <clears throat> yep. I like, I like this process. And uh, this is what we call the uh, Shoshugi Ban. Uh, it's actually inherited from uh, the Japanese. Japan, oh. Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> I am Japanese, but I didn't know that. Shoshigiban is actually a technique by the Japanese that uh, charred the wood. You get a very nice effect. It's also a way to preserve wood. There's just so much effort, so much time put into this work. Most people, including me, we only see the end product. It just feels so nice. Now that Gip has learned the basic woodworking from me, maybe he should see the vibrancy in woodworking in Singapore. So I sent him to meet one of my friends who does amazing work too. In the spirit of sustainability, Aman has asked me to deliver these woods to one of his woodworking friends. I'm pretty excited to uh, see how they will utilize these. Hi. Oh, Hi. Are you Lynn? Yes. Hi. Very nice to Hi, meet you. Nice to meet you. I think this is from Ahmad. Oh wow! Thank you. Uh, thank can you. Can I just put it here? Yeah. Are these handmade? Yes, they are. So we make them all from scratch, from sketching out the designs to cutting them out and sending them down. Like Ahmad, Lin also left her career in the corporate world after she discovered her calling, making wooden jewelry and accessories. Lin showed me how making jewelry is different from making furniture. Too difficult? How, yep. how did I do? Uh, not too bad, I not think. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> not too bad for a guy with big fingers. I just made a half pair of Lin's custom made earrings. I must say, it was far easier than the table that I'm building with Ahmad. Because we are working with small items, right? So I don't necessarily need a very huge monster size mm. machine. So usually we will downsize everything. So these are all considered hobby machines. Why do you think these younger generations like you are more interested in woodworking? I definitely in. see more people like me coming out to actually take on the role of um, building tables and furniture. Hopefully, you know, we can help the dying, supposedly dying trade of woodworking become alive in the next few years. Ahmad, too, is working to grow the number of woodworkers in Singapore. He accepts two apprentices a year and teaches them free of charge. Why I'm taking all these apprentices, I get inspired by my own hardship. So I told myself, get more apprentices, more people will learn. They don't have to stay with me, they can go other places, they can train more people, so the chain cycle will never end. Hey Instagram, welcome. I'm going to teach you guys uh, how to maintain your furnitures and I have a special guest, uh, here's Gib. Hello everybody, I'm Gib Oji-san yeah. from yes. Japan. Japan. Aman also does live streaming to pass on basic woodworking skills to a wider audience. Why do you think it's important to reach out to more people? To keep the craft alive. That's the main, uh, main factor. And do you think there's a danger of Singapore losing its craftsmen? Yes, there is. There's always a danger in any uh, blue-collar job. Everybody wants a better lifestyle. Everybody wants the easier job. Hand skill job is somewhat that uh, people are not interested in. So all these are wood that is from the houses, from the beam, the columns, 
the roof, right? The structure. So what I'm trying to do is, by making all these videos, get people involved, get the awareness out. And that will lead to the continuation of woodworking in Singapore. Yes, definitely. With that, it is time for me to show off what I've been making the past week. I felt really happy when I saw the tables coming together because I've done it from scratch, from choosing the wood that looked very dirty and <laughs> not really nice, but uh, with the help of Ahmad, it, it turned into a beautiful coffee table. Very happy. How do you think I did? Well, not bad, you know? All you have right. done so well. So the final step is to polish, right? Yep. All right. You can be proud that you tell your children or grandchildren that you made this, you see? I'm very excited to take this home. Yeah. yeah. And here it is. From the scrap heap to the workbench, and now finally in my home. Bespoke for me, by me, and a lot of help from Ahmad. I learned that woodworking requires tremendous amount of time and effort. I now see bespoke furnitures differently. I see the stories behind them. I see the faith of somebody who's creating the piece. And for me, it was quite surprising to see the, the woodworking scene in Singapore very energetic. It might take time to see made in Singapore type of furniture, but I would love to see some in the future and I would love to support it for sure. In the next episode of Handmade Tales, I get a taste of the world's rarest pasta. Look at how incredibly thin the pasta is. Made right here in Singapore. You need to kind of pull it eight times with minimal breakage. I continue my discovery of made in Singapore craft. You just kind of pick it up like this. Yeah, just like that. And learn pasta making from Lee Yum Hua, the chef behind private diner, Ben Fato. I'm guessing you're gonna you're gonna hit me with my mess it up. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna hit you with this. <laughs>